ahead and get started. Uh, yeah, so got the recording started. Great. Um, so yeah, so everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. So now that we uh, looked at data access in Python, we're going to go ahead and switch over to R now. Uh, so we're going to do data access in R, and we're going to do it with Jonathan Evanilla here. And so Jonathan is a junior lackey slash apprentice for the Tandy Center for Ocean Forecasting at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. And so throughout this whole thing, uh, please direct all questions to the Slack channel. So that OHW22 tutorials channel. Um, and then so anything just as a reminder, I know we went over this before, uh, but just as a reminder, direct your questions there and um, upvote questions with that plus one there. And uh, throughout this, hopefully John, Jonathan can stop in certain places and uh, kind of stop there and then give us time to ask questions. Uh, but if there's a really burning question, let us know and I'll, I'll try to interrupt Jonathan at uh, ideal times. Uh, but with that being said, uh, go ahead and take over. Right on, thank you so much, Brandon. Uh... Yes, my name is Jonathan. I work at Bigelow. I'm calling in from uh, the joint main satellite location today as uh, we're all together up here in Booth Bay. Uh, before I really get into it, I just wanted to give a few shout outs and a few thank yous. So first of all, thank you to the Ocean Act Week organizers. This is year three for me. I've been involved to different extents, but I always have a good time. And thank you all for putting this together. I also wanted to personally shout out Felipe. Thank you so much uh, for covering the hard stuff in the session prior to this. And I could just uh, take it easy and show some code. Uh, and then also I wanted to shout out my mom. I know uh, you've had a rough few days, but I just want to say I love you. And uh, I hope you enjoy this tutorial if you tune in. Uh, all right. So we're going to be covering. Uh, so just real quickly, Jonathan. Um, so could you just try to increase the font size a little bit? I'm having like one question uh, to do that. All right. Tell me when to stop. One. Maybe one more. Yeah. Hopefully that's good. Uh, we'll see. If that's okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry for the interruption. Go ahead. Uh, so I hope everybody uh, was able to get to the Jupyter Hub R Studio version through the mbget puller. Uh, you should see three .rmd files. Those are what we're going to be working through. I'll start with one, and then if there's time, we can get to the other two. Uh, but yeah, so they asked me to do this data access in R. So I'm going to show uh, a few methods that were covered in the Python version, uh, just to make sure we're on the same page. And then uh, if there's time, I'll show a few other R packages. Um, and I'll start by saying also, I'm a fairly new R user. I've, I've really only been uh, coding in R for about two years, I guess. Uh, before that, I was more using Python and Perl. So uh, here's some things I've learned, uh, some more recently than others. So we're going to load up some packages. Uh, these are all going to be at the beginning. There's going to be this warning uh, because the package SF uh, which is used a lot in this tutorial, was hard to install on Jupyter, I guess. So first we're gonna cover uh, dialing into ERDAP from R. So there's this really nice R package called R ERDAP. Uh, you could get a listing of some servers that R ERDAP knows about by just using this server's function. Uh, Sometimes if I have a big table, I like to use this view function. You can kind of take a look through what's here. I think there's about 60 in here. Uh, the f I'm going to be showing some examples from the first one. And I just right before this was made aware that uh, Coastwatch has given Ocean Hack Week a heads up in the past to not have 100 people dialing in all at the same time. So fingers crossed there's no issues. Uh, we could also search by short name. So I'm just taking that uh, table uh, that I read all the servers in. And because this is narrow, you can't see, but uh, the URL will be right there. And I also wanted to show if you're interested in looking at Coastwatch resources, you can check this link, you can browse through uh, by the different data types, et cetera. 
So we can check uh, what type of data sets are in uh, the server by using this ED data sets function. So I'm making two tables. Uh, one is going to be for table dap, one is grid dap. Uh, I think the default is table dap. So here I give the extra argument, which uh, as grid dap type. So we've got a few hundred table dap, a few thousand grid dap. Uh, not sure what this was. I think it got moved. So you could see all the data sets that way. And if we were to look through this DST or this DSG object, you'd see a listing of all 325 or all 3000. But if we wanna actually search for a specific type of data within that server, uh, we can use a bounding box. So here, I'm just gonna make a little leaflet uh, plot of where I wanna search. I originally grew up in Los Angeles County uh, and I'm an East Coast transplant. So a lot of my examples are gonna be from the Southern California bite. Uh, so we can search with that bounding box uh, and we tell it we only want table DAP data sets to start. And this is the server. You can also give a min and max time uh, if you are looking for a data set from some specific period. Um, so you can see we get this table DAP object out uh, or this list of data sets, sorry. Um, very similar to what we saw before, you can still get the data set ID and query these using that. Uh, so if you wanna do a, a slightly different search where you query by keyword, you just use this ED search, uh, give it a query, tell it what type of data you want, and then give it a URL to the server. So I'm a fisherman, I'm interested in fisheries. So uh, let's check out what kind of landings data is in uh, Coastwatch. So it looks like a few. I think I wanna go with this first one, this uh, California commercial fish landings. It goes from the 1931 to 1978. Not too worried about the time period uh, for the purpose of this tutorial. Uh, so we can get some info on that data set just by using this function info. Uh, and then we're giving it the first ID. So this is the Fed Cal Landings data set. You see what server it's coming from. And then you get a little listing of all the fields that are in there. So it looks like we have month and year. There's some sort of timestamp as well, region, not sure what that would be. Uh, and then a description. Looks like we want it. Uh, so before you make a request, always good to check it out. And that's why I use this info function. If we wanna actually reach in and grab all that data, we're gonna give just like the info function, the ID, and then what server we're pulling from. So this might take a second. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions yet up to this point. Not seeing... I am not seeing any questions right now. Yeah, sweet. And sweet. Okay. So we got all this landings data. Um, so kind of some of the things I'll do if I'm bringing in a new data set I've never worked with into R and I want to kind of inspect it. Use this class function, which is just base R. And we see that this isn't just a plain data frame. This is a table DAP data frame, uh, which just means there's some extra metadata on top. So you can see, uh, has some info here, like uh, I guess when it was updated, not sure. You could also use summary to check out what fields are in there. Um, so it's basically what we saw before using that info but some things here look suspicious to me. So for example, pounds should be a number, uh, but we're getting it as class character. Same with time, uh, there's R has its own date data type and also date time data type. Uh, so a few things I wanna do before we start working with this. Uh, I just wanna turn it into a plain tibble which really under the hood is just a data frame in R. I wanna work with the pounds field. So we're gonna cast it as number using as.numeric. And we're also just gonna keep year, month, 
description, uh, which is actually the species column, and then how many pounds were caught uh, of that species. And also for anyone that's watching this that isn't a normal R user, I'm using this pipe function, uh, which basically takes the output of whatever's on the left-hand side of the pipe and places it in as the first argument on the right-hand side. Uh, and this is also a new pipe function, which can't remember when it was just introduced, but uh, the old one looks like percent arrow percent. So two keystrokes, I guess, is quicker to type than three. So we can get this little subset. Uh, now we see we have description still character, which is just the species, but we have pounds as number, uh, month and year. So one thing you can do if you have a categorical data set like this, so this is uh, records of different species being caught, is you can use this count function from dplyr. And I'm saying I want to count all the descriptions and then arrange them descending by the count. Uh, so not surprisingly, uh, from California, uh, some various bottom fish uh, are at the top of this list. Uh, so specifically for this tutorial, I want to focus in on albacore uh, because that's uh, one of the first tuna or offshore fish I, I caught growing up fishing out of San Diego. So I'm going to filter this uh, subset down to only keep albacore. And then I'm also going to group uh, all of the rows. I'm going to create groups by year and month. Uh, so then in the output, uh, we're going to have one row per year month and then just a sum of all the pounds. Uh, I guess I didn't show what this looks like or what this looks like, but basically you had uh, multiple rows from the same uh, month and year also having uh, the same species. So just to sum all those up. And so we can plot those and take a look at this. Uh, so if you were to ask the question, what's the best month to catch an albacore in Southern California? I guess uh, between the years of 1931 to 1978, we can clearly see August and September, you'd have a pretty good chance. Uh, but they are caught year round. Um, we can also do a further grouping just by year. So we get an annual total of pounds caught. Uh, and then I'm plotting those uh, by year. So, all right, just as a final thing with this table data set, I was got curious and I was like, all right, uh how could we predict a good albacore season i know uh the best way to catch an albacore is with an anchovy so i created a, another subset of just anchovy data and this one i just took uh the annual sum of pounds landed in california for each of the those years so now we have just 47 rows uh one per year with the total pounds Albacore, though, remember, is still by year and month. So we can group that one by year, uh, get an annual sum, and then also mutate in. So add in a new column, and we're going to take it from that anchovies data frame, add the amount of pounds, and then we're going to pass it into ggplot to make a plot. And again, just a note, notice the distinction when you're building a ggplot, you use plus instead of that. Uh, pipe symbol. So not as interesting as I was hoping, but I guess you can see some big anchovy years uh, also had a high albacore catch, but it seemed like some of the bigger ones didn't actually have uh, that many anchovies being landed. So I might take away from that uh, albacore things other than anchovies. So that'll be up to what I have for table dap. Are there any questions? Control shift M does uh, make a pipe, but I haven't figured out how to do the new pipe symbol with the keyboard shortcut. So if anyone has that, uh, 
comment that in that tutorials thread. All right, I guess I'll go on to grid dap. So just like table dap uh, resources, we can also get grid dap. Not sure why I didn't update that, but we can search by the Southern California bite bounding box. And here I'm just saying, give me everything that uh, was for the last 15 days. Um, you get a big listing, data set IDs, and we can check those out. But I actually know which one I want. Uh, I'm just going to go with the most recent version of Mirror. This is that global high res sea surface temps um, coming from JPL. And so with the grid DAP request, I'm just going to give it the data set ID. Uh, and this is your bounding box. So min and mat, lat and lawn. And then for time, you can specify a specific range or you can just say last to get the most recent. And I only want analyze SST. So we can grab that. Super snappy. And then make a plot of it. So I'm bringing in uh, this polygon. This is called World Hires. It's just a very simple, not very pretty land mask. And I'm saying plot that. On top of it, uh, plot this uh, mirror SST raster. And I'm adding a, a color scale. So it looks like it's pretty warm in the Southern California bite right now. Uh, for reference, this is like La Jolla. The Southwest group is probably right here. Palos Verdes. And the water is super warm. That's definitely low 70s. And I can tell you for sure there's some Dorado being caught very close to home right now. So uh, I wish I was back. <laughs> um, all right. So that's what I have for grid app. And then I guess ERD app in general, I could pause again. Not seeing anything else new. Uh, and I do see the comment from Emilio about Coastwatch having a problem. I guess, did anyone else have a problem connecting? If you did, leave a comment or something. All right. Next up, we're going to talk about open DAP resources. And uh, this is a super hot topic in our lab group right now uh, because we're constantly facing this issue of matching up point based observation data uh, to pass into a model, uh, but we want matching environmental covariates and also from multiple sources. So, multiple fields, multiple sources. So, our uh, senior lackey of the lab, Ben Tupper, uh, came up with uh, this system. And rather than me explaining, he wanted to tell you about it in this YouTube video. So we're going to run that to start. So I'm going full screen. Give me a heads up, you can't hear it. Hello, Ocean Hack Week 2022. My name is Ben Tupper, and I'm part of the team at Bigelow Laboratories, Tandy Center for Ocean Forecasting. In this introduction, I'm going to briefly describe a new R package that simplifies your ability to marry your own data sets with those provided online by NASA, European Space Agency, and many others. It's a timeless oceanographic challenge. After months of careful preparation, we bravely go to sea, collect copious data, and carefully record all of the pertinent details in a specially curated notebook. Later, we transcribe the data into spreadsheets that read beautifully to the scientific mind. And then, yes, then let the discoveries begin. Often, when we start to add summary statistics to the spreadsheets with things like conditional formatting and maybe some extra sheets that appear, and they're cleverly linked to other sheets with insightful plots and groundbreaking analyses using pivot tables, macros, and whatnot. In this spreadsheet, we have the perfect encapsulation of all the meaning that is to be extracted from that cruise. And that is something we can share with everyone. But then, as so often happens, 
we need to match our data in time and space with other data sets, such as satellite imagery, buoy data, or model data. Now it becomes important to unpack the pertinent time location data from our beautiful multi-tab spreadsheet. Yes, let the deconstruction begin. So naturally, as enterprising scientists, we turn to the coder in the next office who greets the task of unpacking the Gordian knot of data with their usual joy and good grace. The problem is that our beautifully formed spreadsheet serves our own purpose as well, but it doesn't play well with others. Seriously, getting your data into shape to share with others is very important, but this is not what we want to talk about. That process is a beginning step, and you can learn a lot about that using great resources like Data Carpentry, which you'll find at datacarpentry.org. We want to talk about what comes next after your data is all prepped and ready to mesh with the outside world. What comes next is transforming your table into a simple features data set. Simple Features is a widely adopted set of standards for storing and communicating geospatial information. Location information, such as longitude, latitude, depth, time, they're all organized into a so-called well-known format. This format is readable in a wide variety of software environments, including R and Python. Simple Features does not change your data but it does make it ready for a wide variety of computational transactions, such as GIS-like layering operations, or data extraction from rasters, or for making beautiful graphics and web pages. We have created a very simple package in R called XYZT to ease the transformation from your own tabular data into simple features. The package does not do anything tricky, but it should make your life easier. You'll see in the demonstration following how easy it is to transform a humble spreadsheet into a simple feature data set. In addition, we have created packages that allow you to extract data coincident with your own data in space and time for five different commonly accessed data sets. HICOM model data, ocean biology data, ERSST, blended sea winds, and the Muir GR, GHRSST uh, sea surface temperature maps. It is easy to use any of these packages as a template for building new packages for other data sources. So that's all there is to it, a simple transformation of your data so that you can reach out into the World Wide Web and uh, grab data that matches up with your data. So I'll turn it over now to my colleague Jonathan and my colleague Camille. All right, sweet. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, I hope y'all enjoyed uh, our little video and maybe got a few laughs as well. And I guess just before I get into the open DAP stuff, uh, I wanted to point out, you know, it's nice always if there's a widely used and widely contributed to package uh, that's open source and nice and polished off and manicured. Uh, but sometimes there isn't for what you're trying to do. And I guess in R, I'm not aware of a smoother way to do this. So sometimes you need to roll your own. And so we have uh, some of these home grow packages. XYZT is going to be uh, the larger wrapper. And then we have individual packages for each of the data sources that uh, we want to access. So you can start by opening a connection to a NetCDF file just using this NC open. This is coming from the NCD4 package in R. And I just wanted to show it's linked right here. Uh, you kind of have to know what you're looking for uh to start doing this and so you can look at a catalog like this here's the global high res sst we grab the highest uh most digested level level four and we want global 
coverage. The source is JPL. I think there maybe I missed one. Global JPL. It's not showing up, but you get the idea. You can check out the browser, and there's one of those for also other opened up ready data. So within our MIR or GHR SST package, uh, we've built just simple little functions to retrieve things like, all right, what variables are available in this NetCDF file, or what's the resolution of the data? Uh, so we definitely want this analyze SST field, and we can see that this is super high res, 10th of a degree resolution. We have some example data sets also built into XYZT. These are the Cal Coffee stations. Uh, so I'm just going to start by taking the first 12 of these. Uh, you can see we have three dimensions, X, Y, and Z, I guess. Uh, I'm just going to take the first 12 just to make the extraction a little bit lighter weight. Uh, and then we're going to pass it into this as point function from XYZT, which you'll see uh, out of we get an SF point object rather than just a table with a lat and lawn field. And then within this GHR SST package, uh, we could pass this SF point object, the net CDF file we want to get the data from, and then whatever variable we want and say extract. And then after those points are extracted, I'm just going to bind them back together uh, with the first 12 points of these Cal Coffee stations. And you get a nice high res SST bound together. And I guess this is a simple example. But uh, our goal would be would be to take these points and maybe there's a time dimension as well and marry together multiple of these columns from different sources and different fields uh, in one smooth move or at least a few. So we can check out uh, what this looks like. So this is just the original uh, table with the SST added. And this also works for bounding boxes. So I'm going to take all of the Cal Coffee points and find a bounding box around them. And this is going to change it into a SF polygon. So if I just print that, you can see we have a polygon data site. We have some metadata here, like the min and max lat lawn. And we can also pass this uh, to the extract function. Pretty fast. Uh, we get like some breakdown on what type of uh, how this data looks. And if we just want to plot it using some base R plotting functions, we can plot the layer and then plot our points on top that we extracted. Remember, we only grabbed the first 12, uh, but I guess the Cal Coffee stations would go all the way up here. So there's a nice uh, Southern to Central California sea surface temperature layer. And then when you're working with net CDF connections, you always want to close it. And I actually, I'm not sure the reason, but uh, it's good housekeeping. This would be a good spot to pause for any questions. Looking pretty yeah. quiet. Yeah, and I'll say in any questions, uh, just that remark that with you can also do that pipe uh, possibly with Control Shift M. So sweet, yeah, sweet shortcut there. Yeah. Cool. So web map service data WMS. Uh, I saw it was in the Python version of this tutorial. I actually don't use it very much, but I wanted to show just very quickly that uh, you can add a WMS layer to an interactive map such as Leaflet uh, using this add WMS tiles. I'm plotting this global bathymetry uh, Gebco data set. All you have to say is I want uh, this layer and uh, this is the format to expect. You can put an attribution down here, uh, but a utility of having something like this is if you are producing something like a forecast, 
you could then output it as that uh, image and then send it to maybe a shiny app where you have a leaflet map like this and people can, you know, zoom in or uh, look at what they want. So that's WMS. There's no questions. I'm going to keep going because I would like to show oh, my other stuff. So I guess I'll roll right into buoy data. So in R, uh, you can get data from uh, different sources using, like I said, specifically tailored packages. Uh, one you might use is this R NOAA where you can query uh, National Buoy Data Center data very simply. Um, so to start, we're just gonna load up some packages. I meant to make a block like this in all my notebooks, but didn't get to it. But basically what we're saying is check if these are installed, if they're not install them, and or if they're not install them, and if they are just load them using this library function. So we can, for example, query uh, some buoys based on a bounding box. So this is gonna be a uh, Gulf of Maine. And then this glimpse function just basically uh, rotates your table by 90 degrees, just so you can get a nice uh, vertical listing of all the columns in there. Um, and so then I actually wanna just connect to one buoy. And I know that it's called uh, the Portland Headlight Buoy. So I'm going to query by Portland. There's one other one, but really I want this 44007. Uh, if I'm going to go surfing down here in Maine, I'll either look at this one or uh, one of the CDIP, like Jeffrey's Ledge Buoy. But uh, this one's real time. And so we can check out what's in there by saying I want that buoy ID. Uh, and we're going to get this STD met object, which is going to be some metadata along with the actual data. Um, and I'm querying for all of 2021. And I think that's all I had to say about that. Um, all this loads. Any other questions? Not looking like it. Okay, so we can get a glimpse of that data again with this glimpse function. So we've got a bunch of fields. Uh, some of the observations it looks like are uh, only passed at certain time increments where others are continuous. Um, so one thing that's concerning though is this character uh, time column. So we'll have to address that if we're gonna do anything so I'm going to use the mutate function again and just pass it into this as POSIX to cast it as a date time. And then here I'm just going to make a plot uh, of the significant wave height that was coming from this buoy 4407 for the entire year last year. So something I might take away from a plot like this is the surf is generally flat in the summer on the East Coast. Uh, which so, and I can attest that that is held true this summer. We're probably in the middle of like a two month flat spell. Uh, fall is good and winter is even better if you don't mind cold water. And I guess I'll just roll right into this last one. So, some, some uh, OG veteran programmers might think I'm silly for in, including, uh, a simple task like this into this tutorial, but this is actually something I had to figure out how to do uh, not too long ago. So if you wanna get some data like these interannual time series, they're like climate indices from NOAA. Uh, for example, we wanted to query this North Atlantic Oscillation Index. They host it just as this plain text uh, at a URL. So, if this is something, if, if, if you come across a data set like this, you can use this little workflow. We're going to be using the stringer package uh, as well as some other tidyverse um, packages in R. So I'm going to pass in the URL and just use this read lines command. 
you'll see it's going to bring it in. Uh, it looks like it knows how to separate the rows, uh, but we do have some weird stuff like they're running off, printed the whole thing, and then here's the last row. So we can trim it out using this SCR trim. I thought there's a little more in here, but I guess it should work. Uh, and then actually put it into columns. I don't know why it doesn't show my whole. Okay, here we go. So I want to trim off both sides, get these, get rid of these uh, quotes because it's treating this as a whole string that's split by spaces. And I want to put it together uh, and then add in commas for those spaces. So basically, we're just making a CSV. And then finally, you just read it in as a CSV. And we're saying use every month of the year as column names. So you already got a sneak peek about that. Uh, but if you wanted a long form of this data, um, you can then use this pivot longer function, uh, which I think comes from dplyr. And you're going to say, I want to pivot on all of those columns. Uh, and then I want the names to go to month and then the values that are in these to go to a column called AMO, which I guess should be NAO in this case. So if you'd rather have one row per year and month, uh, you could just pivot it like that. And finally, if you wanted to compute an annual mean, use group by, which I've showed a few times throughout this session. And then just say uh, the mean is going to be the mean of this NAO column and then mutate on the new column. And you can see over on the side, now we have an annual mean if you wanted to use that. So it looks like it's 3.53. I'm surprised I got through everything, but I've got a few minutes for questions and it looks like it's pretty quiet. Yeah, I'm not quite seeing any questions, but that's okay. Um, and then I guess I'll use this time to say if uh, building out our package XYZT sounds interesting. We do have a project. I don't think it's too late to join. And we definitely are looking for people that are interested in one, helping add some more data sources, but two, if you do a lot of programming in R, uh, but you'd like to learn how to write an R package, uh, which means uh, documenting everything and creating help pages for those and creating a description file that uh, declares everything you need to import or what the package depends on. So then you could at least install it from GitHub uh, and maybe Cran, if uh, you stick it out that long, then come join Ben and I. And Pack it out this week. Uh, so it looks like we do have one question. And just a time check, uh, we're at 54. So yeah, we do have one question there, though, if you want to. So yeah, see, uh, preferred way to map gridded data. Uh, I think recently we've been using stars, but I don't want to give away too much because Ben is going to cover uh, mapping or plotting gridded data in R tomorrow morning, or I guess tomorrow midday. So that'll be a nice continuation on this. Great. Well, oh yeah, I guess I saw Alex's message. If you haven't heard yet, to get out of R, if you click this sign out or this shut down, it doesn't do anything. So you're just going to want to go in and edit your URL here just to home. Hopefully this works and then stop my server. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. And if anybody else has any lingering questions, just don't, you know, go ahead and throw it in Slack. And I'm sure he'll be monitoring Slack throughout the day. 
so thank you very much. And we will now take a short break and then we'll be looking at machine learning, a machine learning introduction uh, with Valentina. Uh, so thank you very much and I'll see you all soon. And thank you, Brandon, too. Mm -hmm.